Hello folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. We are in our series called Taken. And so far in this series, I've, I've tried to just be very methodic, uh, methodical um, and deliberate going back to all the things that, that we have learned together from God's Word Bible numbers, Bible typology, uh, symbolisms in the Bible, prophecies that we know are going to happen, and so on. And I've just kind of been laying a foundation for that, but not really telling you where exactly I was going with it. And really, this is sort of how my mind works. If, I, if I'm going to explain something, uh, especially, especially, and I'll be honest with you, I don't know of anybody else that has ever taken the position that I'm going to share with you. And I myself am not 100% convinced. So as I'm going through the scriptures that we've gone through already and the scriptures I'm going to share with you today, I'm also checking myself to make sure that I'm reading the scriptures accurately, that I'm not trying to rest the scriptures, twist them, and make them say something that they really are not saying. In other words, I could be wrong. Let God be true and every man a liar, which is why I like to use a lot of scriptures. So I ask you, don't believe me, but you do believe the word of God. And I think today is going to mark a change in the approach of how I've been taking this because I'm going, to, I'm going to reveal some things today that I think, well, I will tell you this. On the way in this morning, God showed me something to go along with this and I've added it into my notes for today. We're going to, I'm going to show you what God showed me on the way over here this morning. And when it occurred to me, I just like, I'm driving and I just froze. And I'm just, and that's what happens. I'm thinking through what God has shown me. So let's get into it. Uh, our first two scriptures that we've looked at every time, Matthew 24, and comparing it with Mark 13 and the language. The Bible is deliberate. Everything that God says in here and every, every word in here has a purpose in it. Don't take anything out. Don't skip over anything. But just compare scripture, compare spiritual things with spiritual things in the Bible. God will give you understanding. Matthew 24, verse 30, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And notice this, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now, if Mark didn't say something different and sort of add to this passage, I probably would have never considered it. Because when I would read this passage before from one end of heaven to the other, I sort of, I guess I would think like maybe from one end of everything under heaven to, to the other end of everything under heaven. But that's not what he said. He said he would gather together from one end of heaven to the other. Remember, we've talked about the three heavens, the sky above us, the universe outer space that extends so far out there, we can't even tell where the universe ends. We know where our atmosphere ends, it's the Kármán line, remember that? So I believe then there is an end to the universe, there is something that separates the end of outer space from the third heaven where God is, all right? So I can't say from Matthew 24, that Jesus is going to gather everybody in heaven and bring them back down to the earth to meet us in the air and to go back to heaven with them. 
So if they're not in the third heaven, and I wouldn't think that they're all on an airplane flying around in the, in the sky, where does that leave us? And if you would have said a hundred years ago, that would that be 1922? If you would have said a hundred years ago in 1922, um, there's going to be people living in outer space. They would say to you, you're crazy. You're nuts. Nobody can live in outer space. But from the time the Wright brothers invented the airplane to the time we landed on the moon, that was just 60 years. Technology bounced quickly. And we now live in an age where man is living in the second heaven. There's people up there right now living out their lives in the second heaven. Look at, let's look at what Mark said. Mark said, Mark 13, 26, Then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. That's pretty much what he said in Matthew. And then shall he send his angels, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of the earth, to the uttermost part of heaven. So clearly now, Jesus is sending his angels to gather people from two locations. Those who are on any place on the earth and those who would be any place in the heavens. Now, I'm not just relying on these two verses for this idea. Trust me, I haven't got to them yet because I'm trying to build up to them. But I found verses that if you saw them and you really thought about it for a minute, you would gasp. You would gasp and go, oh, look at that. So I'm building up to that, okay? And being methodical. Last week, we took a look at the number four and sort of gave you the idea of what it means, or one of the meanings of the number four has to do with the gospel. Remember, the gospel story is in four books in the Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Paul talked about another gospel, another gospel, any other gospel, any other gospel. So the false gospel is also related with the number four, all right? And then... The number four related to the spiritual realm where Paul talked about it in Ephesians 6, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. And the fourth one is the key. He said spiritual wickedness, not like fleshly wickedness. He's talking about devils doing spiritual wickedness where? Way up there in high places, and we wrestle against them. We then took that and applied it to things like uh, the, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. Remember his astrologers, magicians, sorcerers, and his Chaldeans, four of them could not didn't, couldn't tell Nebuchadnezzar what his dream was, but then Azariah, Mishael, um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, the four men who served God against the four men who practiced the devil's religion, and which group of four had it right? It was the three Hebrew children plus Daniel who got the vision right, and Nebuchadnezzar spared their lives because of it, all right? In other words, God's always going to win, and God's people are always going to win. So that's sort of where we left you uh, last week in understanding that number four. Um, a couple more examples that sort of illustrate what I'm referring to that I didn't get time to get to last week. Uh, one of them is in Daniel chapter 7. Notice this. Daniel spake and, and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea, 
and four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. Now, a lot of people, a lot of scholars have attributed these four beasts to being similar to the four kingdoms that Nebuchadnezzar saw. Because if you think about it, Nebuchadnezzar saw a head of gold, a chest of brass, or a chest of silver, the legs of brass, and the feet of iron and clay. Four kingdoms. Out of those four, which one is different? Well, you have gold, silver, brass, but with the iron, the iron is mingled with something, miry clay. It's different than the other three. And I can tell you, I can go through all through the Bible and show you, if you've got four things in the Bible, three of them are going to be identical. The fourth one is always going to be different. Let me give you an illustration. Shem, Ham, Japheth, and Noah. Which one's different? Noah. Because God made the covenant with him. Um, Shem, Ham, and Japheth were his sons that just helped Noah build the ark. And, you know, that's what saved them. Another one. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Anybody that's studied the Gospels know that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called the synoptic Gospels because they tell pretty much the same story in much the same way. John is completely different. John writes a completely different account, not, a, not an, an opposing account, but he just tells the story differently than Matthew, Mark, and Luke does. John is different. Um, how about this one? Uh, Rachel, Leah, Billa, and Zilpah the four women that gave birth to the tribes of Israel. Which one's different? Rachel is because she was the true love of Jacob. Okay, and you can take that all through the scriptures and see, and, and what we're gonna see here, these four great beasts that come up out of the sea, the fourth one, the fourth one is different. Another illustration, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel. Well, Daniel's the one that's different because it was to Daniel that the vision was given. Now I'm going to show you another one. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, the Son of God. Clearly, clearly, the Son of God is different here than the other three because without the Son of God being in that fiery furnace, those three would have perished in that fire. But think about it. And this is sort of where we're going today. In dealing with the number four, as designating a place, a location, a direction, okay? When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the Son of God are in the fiery furnace, Nothing happens to them. They're in the midst of burning things with smoke all around, fire all around, and yet when they come out, their hair is not singed, their clothes are not burnt, they don't even have the smell of smoke on them. So it's like they were in a completely different spatial location, even though they were seen in the fiery furnace. I'll try to explain that as I go on this week, okay? But let's get back to Daniel 7, verse 7. After this I saw in the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Notice this, that the fourth beast is different from the other three. Just like in the four kingdoms, the fourth kingdom is different than the three previous kingdoms that came. Because the fourth kingdom is where they principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness in high places, mingle themselves with the seed of men. And you have the same thing here. 
this fourth beast is different than the other three. Okay, so that's one of the examples. I had this in my notes for last week, and we just didn't get time to put it in here. Here's another one. Ezekiel chapter 1. And now this is going to play into, and if you've seen any of my studies on UFOs, unidentified flying objects, the military term for it is unknown aerial space or aerial phenomenon, Um, because they don't like UFOs, they don't like that phrase, because it's attached to weird people and so on. So the military has got to be different. But if you've seen my series on that, you know that Ezekiel chapter 1 is describing God's chariot. And in this case, and there's no doubt in my mind, Psalm says the chariots of the Lord are 20,000, even thousands of angels. God has a chariot. In fact, he's got 20,000. In fact, he's probably got thousands more than 20,000. And his chariots are actually living, not just the whatever is pulling them, but the chariot itself is alive because it's made up of four living creatures. Ezekiel says living creatures. John says in Revelation 4, four beasts. But we're talking about the same thing. Let's read it. Ezekiel 1 verse 4, And I looked and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north. That's going to be very important in the future of this series. A great cloud and a fire unfolding itself, and a brightness was about it. And out of the midst thereof, as the color of amber, out of the midst of the fire, also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures. And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man, and every one had four faces, and every one had four wings. Now, if you go, and for time's sake, we won't go and read uh, all of Ezekiel chapter 1, but there is so much in here. You read Ezekiel chapter 1. Count up the number of times that Ezekiel says four, and they had four this, and they had four wings, and they faced four directions, and they did four things, and four, and four, and four. The number four is all through Ezekiel chapter one. What is that telling you? First thing it's telling you is, is that God's chariot was not made in Detroit, Michigan, or it wasn't made in Japan, or it wasn't made in China, or they didn't move the the chariot factory down to Mexico to pay cheaper wages. God's chariot does not, was not made anywhere here on this earth. It was made in a different realm than ours. And here's what's interesting. God's chariot, as seen in Ezekiel 1, has the ability to do things that no car, no chariot, no plane, no horse, no tricycle, nothing can do on this earth. Because Ezekiel described the chariot of God as running and returning as lightning. Now, have you seen lightning? Lightning is fast. What that means is, is that God's chariot has the ability to just appear from out of the north. And when it takes off, it takes off instantly. It doesn't... and then slowly get faster. It goes from zero to the speed of light in absolutely no time whatsoever. Anybody that has seen a legitimate UFO, that's what they've seen. They've seen these things make motions and movements that defy the laws of physics in our three-dimensional space that we live in. The ability to make right-angled turns without stopping and then turning or without making a big, wide half-circle to do it. They'll see it go this way and then turn that way. 
or it'll drop down. The, the people in the carrier group out in the Pacific that saw the Tic Tac UFO, the, um, the radar operator, his testimony was that his radar goes all the way up to 80,000 feet up in the air. And he sees a whole fleet of these UFOs appear at 80,000 feet and literally drop down to the almost the surface level of the ocean in about a second. You can't even fall that fast. You can't fly that fast and get to the, get to the ocean from 80,000 feet down to sea level. No way, no how can that be done. But that was his testimony. He said, I watched him do it. Okay, so clearly these chariots can defy the laws that govern this three-dimensional universe, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were doing when Jesus, the Son of God, was with them. The laws of physics in the three-dimensional universe would have had those guys burn up in just a matter of seconds but they didn't even smell like, it was like they weren't even there. Although Nebuchadnezzar and everybody else saw them there. So where were they then? What was happening there? Jesus is gonna appear in the blinking, in the twinkling of an eye. He's gonna come all the way from heaven to earth before a man can wink his eye or blink his eye. Jesus is going to come and take his people up with him before man can finish blinking his eye. That's how fast that's going to happen. And so I'll say this to those of you who are listening and you're not sure you're saved, I wouldn't wait. Because if you think you're going to wait until after you see a rapture event taking place. It's already too late. The ark has been shut. Everything is finished and God says, I'm done. I'm done. And it's going to go that quick. All right. So read Ezekiel 1 and you'll see this number four. What that's telling us is that these angels, this chariot that God is riding on in Ezekiel 1 did not originate anywhere here on the earth. It came from a different direction. And I'll explain that. I first found out about this uh, when I was writing uh, the books on numbers, the uh, first book by divine order, and the second book, the King James Code. And um, I was thinking of the number three. And um, I, I, I remembered a verse in the Bible where Paul mentioned, you know, depth and width and breadth. And I thought, yeah, that's three. Paul's talking about the three dimensions that are in this world. So I find that verse and I go read it. And here it is in Ephesians 3, 17. And I was taken aback because Paul didn't mention three different directions. He mentioned four. He said in Ephesians 3, 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. And I read that and I went, well, I was wrong about that. Now, wait a minute. Why is God talking about four directions here? What, what is that fourth direction? I didn't understand it at the time. Let me ask you this question. Let's say that, let's say that uh, I'm here in Missouri, United States, and um, we've, we do ministry in Kenya, which is pretty much on the other side of the world, all right? So if I'm here and 
you say to me, Pastor Mike, can you point to me where heaven is? I would go, it's up there. Up, straight line. Meanwhile, somebody asked one of the Kenyan pastors that we work with in Kenya, where is heaven? They're on the other side of the world. They would say, it's up. Now, obviously, me and a Kenyan pastor are pointing in opposite directions. But we're both pointing up. So, you know, you're on the earth and you're standing on the ground. And it's not hard to say that direction there is up. When you get into space, I, and I watched, a, um, I watched a documentary last night about um, the International Space Station and, and Elon Musk and how he's sending, you know, he's the one that's carrying American astronauts now to the, to the ISS. And um, one of the female astronauts from America that went to the space station, she was going to spend six months. She said for the first several days, as she's going through there, uh, she felt like she was always upside down. And it was very disorienting to her. But then something snapped in her mind and she immediately came, her mind changed somehow, some way and moving through that space station, no matter if she was facing this way, that way, that way, or that way, it all seemed natural to her. In other words, her mind had adapted to the fact that there, up in space, there is no up, down, left, right, backward, forward, because there's no gravity when you're in space. Which way is up? You ever thought about that? I, I have. When you get into space, get beyond the Earth's atmosphere, get, you know, 200,000 miles away from the Earth, where is up? Where is up? Now, notice this. Go back to this verse in Ephesians. And Paul identifies the first three directions are breadth, which is sort of width, and length, how long something is, this way. Breadth would be this way. Length would be this way, the distance between me and you. Depth, the direction between me and what's down there. The fourth direction he called height. Height. So, when I was, did this research years ago, I looked up some things about, in the back of my mind, I knew I'd heard something about the fourth dimension. Um, so I'm going, what is the fourth dimension? I typed that in and I read everything I could find on it. Number one, there is a fourth dimension mathematically. Uh, mathematicians, physicists, those who study time, space, different things like that, they understand that there is a fourth dimension. It relates to time, and it is a direction right now that nobody anywhere in this world can point to and say, that's the fourth direction or the fourth dimension. And it's because we're such a part of a three-dimensional world that that's all we understand. And yet here God plainly is identifying a fourth spatial dimension or fourth direction. Not just this way, not just this way, and not just this way. You know, if you use a, um, you know, a piece of paper with all the little squares on it and you're going to plot something, there is uh, X direction, Y direction, and Z direction, okay? Three dimensions. Z plus 10 would be where you are now and 10 degrees up above you. 
Z minus 10 would be where you are now and 10 degrees below you. And the X would be, let's say, east and west of you and the Y would be north and south of you, okay? So that's how people in planes navigate. I don't know much more about it, but I do kind of understand that. But how would you navigate if you only know X, Y, and Z coordinates, and then somebody throws in something that is beyond X, Y, Z coordinates, how would you be able to navigate to that when you don't even know where that is? God calls it height. So what I decided to do was go to the Bible and find out what God said about the word height. You know, like, if you haven't seen me talk about this, there is a, a video I did called the King James Code on the number four, a study of the number four in the Bible. There's also an episode of Pastor Mike Online where I said it's called the fourth F-O-U-R-T-H, the fourth is with you, okay? And I go into a pretty detailed discussion of the fourth dimension. And I, that phrase, the fourth, may the fourth be with you, is a reference to Christ. He was with, he was the fourth man in the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, okay? Didn't have anything to do with Star Wars, okay? So anyway, Let's, let's take a look at the word height in the Bible. My favorite places to go to define words is usually Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, places like that, okay? Let's look in Job 22, verse 12. It's not God in the height of heaven. So it's asking a question, a rhetorical question, and the answer is yes. Notice that it was said that God is where the height is. And he calls that heaven. Remember, there are three heavens. And I think I did this illustration. So let's picture the earth. We're here on the earth. That's, that's the first place. The first heaven would be the second place we could go. The second heaven is the third place we could go. And the fourth and the third heaven is the fourth place we could go. You follow me? Earth, first heaven, earth, first heaven, second heaven, third heaven is the fourth place between God and us. Four degrees of separation here, okay? So God is in the height and God, by way of the Holy Ghost through Job, says that that height is where heaven is. And then he said, behold the height of the stars, how high they are. So not only is God in the height, the stars are in the height as well. And according to scripture, what are stars really? What are they, what, what are they really? They are angels. Revelation 12, the dragon took his tail and cast a third of the stars down to the earth. We don't mean, we don't mean when we say that, that the dragon took, um, humongous stars and cast them down to the earth that would have burnt the planet up right and some of those stars like like our own sun the earth is minuscule compared to our sun and then there are suns out there stars out there in the universe where our sun is minuscule to those there are some big stars out there so we don't mean that he's going to literally take those stars star objects, cast them down the earth. No, it later says that Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels and prevailed not, and the dragon and his angels were cast down to the earth. Clearly, those stars are angels. Clearly, they are, okay? 
So Psalm 102 verse 19, for he hath looked down from the height of his sanctuary, from heaven did the Lord behold the earth. Well, where is God's sanctuary? It's in the height. And then he said, it's in heaven, the height where the Lord looks down upon the earth. See, this is why you can't get to God's heaven by any other means than the cross of Jesus Christ. Do you know why? Because you can't even figure out what direction that's in. Not, not only is it so far beyond the realm of the space, outer space, the universe, the second heaven, and the fact that there, no machine would ever get us there, we don't even know what direction to go into once we get into space. Because north, south, east, and west just don't work as navigational tools in space. It's just not there. Proverbs 25, 3, the heaven for height and the earth for depth. See, he's mentioned in the two directions. And the earth for depth and the heart of kings is unsearchable. The heaven, so let me shorten this verse. The heaven for height is unsearchable because we literally cannot in our minds fathom nor think of nor consider what a fourth dimension is. All we know is this way, this way, and this way. That's all we know is three directions. And yet there is a fourth direction. So if you go back now to like Ezekiel 1 and read the chariot of God with the four angels, which have four faces and they have four wings and they have four wheels and they go four directions and on and on. You read all those fours in there. Now it starts to make sense. When you have principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness in what kind of places? High places. So some people don't have a problem using the phrase fourth dimension. And if you have a problem with that, just simply say the spiritual realm. There is a realm above where we are right now that exists where every angel, good and bad, exist, which is why we can't really see them unless they somehow, some way make an appearance in front of us. We, we can't see them because they're in a dimension that is above ours. And God has not designed our eyes to be able to see those things. The creature is made subject to vanity, not willingly, Paul says. So there are things that we just can't do because the war that's going on or the battle that's going on for you and your soul every day is taking place in that spiritual realm, that fourth dimension. Okay. Now, um, let's go to Genesis 11 because there's a story there that I believe has everything to do with where I'm going with, with this, with this whole idea and what I believe the Bible's telling us is going to happen. So remember what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 1, the thing that hath been is the thing that shall be, and there is no new thing under the sun. So all we have to do is go through the pages of this Bible and look at the stories, the events, the wars, the kings, the people, and understand that they are shadows of things to come. That they reference not only historical events, but future events as well. Let's go to Genesis 11, because we're going to find the word height in there. Genesis 11. This is the Tower of 
Babel. Babel later becomes Babylon. Okay, follow me? So in Genesis 11, verse 4, the people of the city of Babel say this, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now the question, of course, is what heaven were they referring to? If they were referring just to the first heaven, well, that's easy. Anybody, I mean, anybody can build like a three-story building and the third story, if you're on the roof, you, it could be said you're up in the, in the sky, more so than the people walking around on the ground out there. But I think they were aiming way beyond that. Let's build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. Were they referring to the second heaven? The ability, giving us a prophecy of man's ability to leave this world and the first heaven that surrounds it and put himself in the vast ocean of the second heaven, outer space. Could it not also be a reference, man's wicked desire to put himself in the third heaven where God is. So that's where we bring what is said in Isaiah 14 about Lucifer. How have thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? What heaven did he fall from? Well, I think he fell from where God is. And how have thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? How have thou cut down to the ground? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. What heaven? The sky? Beyond that. Outer space? Beyond that. The third heaven where God is? You got it. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most, what's that word? High. He wants to be the top dog of everything. And I referenced this documentary with Elon Musk, and it was about him and his company called SpaceX. You know what he named the capsule that they designed for the astronauts to ride from Cape Canaveral, Florida, up into space to dock with the International Space Station. It's called the Dragon. The Dragon literally ascended into heaven, ascended above the heights of the clouds. And so now man has a permanent dwelling place in a place that a hundred years ago you would have never believed people would be living in outer space. And because, because governments, you know, in the 60s, it seemed like it just seemed the natural thing for America to try to prove itself against the Russians. And yes, we're going to beat them to the moon. Let's spend all the money we can. But nowadays, we've got so many wicked politicians who hate to see money going into stupid things like building rockets when it could actually go in our pockets. So that's why governments, especially the American government, doesn't really have much interest in space. It's, it's now the private sector. 
Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, who owns Amazon.com, the rich men of the world, they're the ones who have taken over the reins of getting man to live amongst the stars. And what are the stars? The angels, both good and bad. The gods, that's what they are. Now, let's skip forward. Jeremiah, in Jeremiah 51, is talking about Babylon. Remember, Babylon is Babel. In almost the same way, look at what it says. Though Babylon should mount up to heaven, and though she should fortify the height, there's that word, of her strength, Yet from me shall spoilers come unto her, saith the Lord. Do you know why a mountain or a hill is so important in military conquest? Well, it's actually pretty simple. Whoever can position himself on a hill or a mountain has an immediate advantage. Because it's a whole lot easier to stand on that hillside on a tower and shoot down everybody that comes along as they're trying to get up the hill than it is for the people at the bottom of the hill to try to get up the hill. So think about it. Our God is the most high God, which means nobody can defeat him. He has the high position of everything. Okay? Um, every year in England, there is a, um, I, I'll tell you about how high, height matters. Um, the queen or whoever's the monarch of England has been going on for a long time. They, the, the king or the queen of England, begin each new session of parliament. And they go to the House of Lords to do this. And in the House of Lords, there is a, throne for the monarch of England and a chair next to that that is about six inches lower than the monarch's chair. When the queen sits in that throne, her husband, when he was alive, Prince Philip, would sit next to her at her right hand, but his chair was six inches lower than her chair was. And even though it's just six inches, it's the idea that the monarch sits higher above anybody else. Even though her husband is supposed to be the, like the leader of the household, right? Uh Uh-uh. You watch the queen and Prince Philip in old news stories. He's always walked behind her. He's understood his place from the moment she became queen. Okay? But anyway, Babylon, even though Babylon should mount up to heaven. Now, there are people in this world, and I just, I'm not going to spend any time with this. Believe the earth is flat and believe that the heaven is this like hard shell, like a snow globe. The earth is at the bottom of a snow globe and there's a shell going over it, and that's how, that's how high heaven is. Well, that's stupid. Bible doesn't say anything. Bible doesn't say anything about that. So, of course, flat earth people don't believe that there's any satellites revolving around the earth. They believe the moon is a projection by NASA. Yeah. So whenever I have flat earth people take me on and they say, NASA was all, NASA made everything up. It's all a lie. They're trying to keep it secret. They never sent anybody to the moon because there's no way you can get, there is no such thing as outer space. There's no such, no such place whatsoever. It doesn't exist. And yet God said it right here. Though Babylon should mount up to heaven. And I have a lot of other verses as we go along to show you this same concept. Whose idea was it 
that man was going to mount up into heaven. Whose, whose idea was that? God is the one who came up with that. Not NASA. Not the evil, not the devil who wants everybody to think the world is round, but really it's flat, and that's the devil's biggest secret that he's keeping. That's his mass deception, even though the Bible never mentions one thing about it. Not one thing. So here we have Babylon, a city and a tower, reaching up into heaven, don't we? Take a look at this. Up at the top, Saturn V rocket. Saturn V rocket is what took all the Apollo missions to the moon and back. And what is a rocket? It's a tower. A city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. And that's exactly what happened in the Apollo programs, space shuttle programs, whatever. Men going up into the second heaven. Right next to that is the International Space Station. Now we have a permanent, uh, back in the 70s, the Russians and the Americans, Russians were better at it than we were, but the Russians had um, these small space stations, the Soyuz and uh, so, on, so on space stations up there. They had a couple of astronauts up there all the time. Uh, and then finally they started working together and built the International Space Station. And it's, it is pretty big out, it's a pretty big place. And there's a constant number of people living up in the heavens right now. And anybody that has been to space beyond the Kármán line, up into outer space, say it changes your whole way of thinking. Why? Because you see things from a higher position than you ever saw them before. And trust me, that does make a difference. It makes a lasting impact in a person's mind. Edgar Mitchell, the sixth man to walk on the moon, on his way back from walking on the moon, going back to the earth, it's a three-day trip, and somewhere during that three-day trip back to the earth, Edgar Mitchell had what's called a Samadhi experience. It's an, it's an Hindu concept that all of a sudden he goes into like a trance and he sees his molecules. Yeah, it's weird. His molecules and the molecules and the atoms that make up everything in the universe. And he discovers that his atoms... And the atoms of earth, the atoms of the moon, the atoms of the capsule that he's in, the atoms that are in the sun, the atoms that are in all the stars and planets all throughout outer space, they're actually all connected together and that he had this realization that he was one with all of the creation, including what their version of a God concept would be. In their version of it, God is the universe. And Edgar Mitchell had this eye-opening experience that he was one with everything in the heavens and the earth out to the outermost limits of the universe. He was joined with it all. Whew, that's crazy. That's insane. That, but see, it changed his perspective of life, religion, God, and everything. Now, the first two pictures here are things that have actually happened. We've gone into space, gone to the moon. We have a permanent position in space, people living in the second heaven. Then there are the concepts. Asgardia, the space nation. This is actually a real thing where you can go on this website and sign up and register for citizenship to live in the second heaven, in a city that this guy has called Asgard or Asgardia. And it comes from Nordic mythology. 
if all you got to do is watch the Marvel series. You know who Thor and Odin and Loki is? They live on Asgard, one of the nine realms that are in the universe. Earth is Midgard. And where they live is up in the heavens in Asgard, and they are like half gods, demigods. You know what a half god is? It's a giant. It's an offspring of the Son of God, a son of the gods, and the daughters of men. Okay? Asgard, you can join it right now if you want to. And then Jeff Bezos saying, here we are trying to talk about going to Mars and going way off planet. He said, why don't we do this? We could actually use the resources on Earth to build multiple revolving space stations that would have sustainable everything. We could put dirt up there. We could get water from off the earth. We could plant things. We would have sunlight. We, we could build an atmosphere up there. We would have a type of gravity. And he said, we could build hundreds of these things. And we would have people living up in the heavens like the gods do. It's all about man becoming like the gods and living off of this earth. Do you know what I think is driving that? I think down deep inside, most everybody realizes that this world is not going to last very much longer. Whether it's the aliens telling people that or people like me reading the Bible and saying, uh, God's fixing to destroy this earth. And I think it's the idea that if we leave the earth, when it blows up or whatever happens, we'll continue on. Elon Musk said it is man's destiny to put himself to live among the stars, to spread himself out and live on other planets. He said, it's our destiny. We have to do this to, cont to carry on our species. He's dead serious about this. So it's not just some make-believe thing. There are billionaires who are pouring their life's fortune into this to kickstart it into happening. And NASA pretty much has become the space agency that doesn't send anybody to space. After the shuttles, after they shut down the shuttle program, what did NASA do? Not much, I can tell you that. Then, take a look at this. Once we've landed on the moon and built a station on the moon where people would live on the moon, we would use that as a launching pad to send people to put a permanent dwelling place on another world, Mars. But then man wouldn't stop there, would he? Man would just keep going, and eventually, eventually, man would learn how to fold space and time and be able to go from planet Earth, which is over here, let's say to another planet, which is a hundred light years away, and we would never make that trip now because it's impossible. But if we learned how to fold space together and bring those two points together like with a wormhole, we could be there in just a matter of hours instead of matters of a hundred or a thousand years. That technology is being worked on right now. Okay, so the whole idea of man going into space going into this higher, eventually into this higher dimension is true and it's real, okay? Now, so let's take everything we've learned now. Go back to, because I shared with you some of the stories in the Bible that have the number 40 in it, which is based on the number four. And you understand now the number four represents the spiritual realm, fourth dimension, okay? Um, the movie Interstellar dealt with that particular subject that a civilization of future humans 
learned, had gotten so advanced that they, they learned how to live above the third dimension, even the fourth dimension, and the fifth dimension, and so on, and was able to send messages back to man in the past to teach man how to get off planet Earth because Earth had a blight on it and all of its food was being killed. To teach man how to get into space, go into wormholes, and find another planet to live on. It's the whole message of interstellar. Okay? So, let's go look at these stories again. First place in the Bible that has 40 days in it is what? It's when God destroyed the earth. Okay? When God destroyed the earth. Genesis 7. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights. So with that number 40, based upon the number 4, Jesus himself said, as it was in the what? Days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man, the days of Noah. And here we have 40 days, 40 nights. What does that tell me in that story? That tells me that this future event that's going to take place has everything to do with the coming of the fourth kingdom to this world. Because where did the water come from? Well, the first place it came from was the fountains of the great deep, from underneath. Second place it came from was the windows of heaven, from down from above. So let's identify the symbolic meaning of these floods that's being talked about in Genesis 7. Isaiah 28, 2, Behold, the Lord hath a mighty and a strong one, which as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters overflowing, shall cast down to the earth with the hand. The Lord has a mighty and a strong one, which as a tempest of hail and a destroying storm, as a flood of mighty waters coming. So we see now that the waters of Noah have a significant meaning to something that's going to happen in the last days. And, and we know that God promised he would not destroy the earth with water anymore. But it said it was going to be as a flood. What does he mean by that? Isaiah 59, 19. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood. The Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. Do we have enemies? Yes, they're principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. The fourth kingdom is an enemy. And God said they're going to come in like a flood. And where did the flood waters come from? Beneath the earth and from the heavens, didn't they? Psalm 18, 4, the sorrows of death compassed me and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. So now we see the symbolic reference in the Bible. Floods, again, referring to a race or a group of evil men, an evil nation coming against the people of this world, which I believe is why Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk and all these rich people want to say, hurry up, we need to get out of this earth because something's going to happen here, okay? So, think of, and if you've followed my ministry before, you know where I'm going with this. But to some of you, it may be brand new. In the book of Revelation, two events happen where hordes and hordes and hordes of devils arrive on earth and just take over everything. Where do they come from? 
The first group is seen in Revelation 9. The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit. And there arose a smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke, of, out of the smoke locusts upon the earth. And unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And then the Bible goes on to describe these locusts. That they have the faces of men and hair of women. And they sound like horses and chariots and all kinds of things, right? And where did they come from? The lower part of the earth. The bottom. And how do you get a bottomless pit? Is there not a bottom to everything? Not if you're in a different dimension. Okay? The devil's going to be cast into a bottomless pit and fall for a thousand years. How in the world does that happen? Okay? It's in a different dimension. So the first group of evil devils that God's going to use to invade this, this world are coming up from the heart of the earth. The heart of the earth. Your heart has two, three, four chambers. Okay? That's group A. Group B comes from a different place. Revelation 12, 3, And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Down on in verse 7, And there was a war in heaven. Stop right here. Was there a war in Canaan land? Yes. Who fought that war? God's saints and the evil people that were in Canaan land. Canaan land's a picture of heaven. Michael fights a war against the dragon and his angels. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So, we have the floods coming up out of the deep and devils coming up out of the deep. And we have the floods coming down from heaven. God opened the windows of heaven. And what fell to the earth? The floods of the enemies, the devil, and one third of the angelic realm. And see, when God kicks them out, Who's going to take their place? We are. Just like God telling Israel, when you get into Canaan land and you wipe out all the inhabitants thereof, you won't even have to build houses. There's already houses there. You can live in their houses, use their silverware, play in their pool, use, you know, watch their big screen TV and eat all their food in their refrigerator if you want to. God said, I'll just give it to you. And when he said, when Jesus said, when we die in the resurrection, we'll be as the angels in heaven. Mm, I love this. Now, let's look at another one. And, and keep in mind now, this fourth dimension is different than the other three dimensions. Okay? So if I spent 40 days in my office and I didn't eat or drink, I wouldn't spend 40 days in my office. I'd live about three or four days. Without drinking, I would die. What about Moses, though? Moses, Exodus 34, 28, he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water, and he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant and the, the Ten Commandments. See, one of the things about the fourth dimension is that a lot of people say that it represents time. And being in the fourth dimension means you're not bound by linear time. Linear time is how we experience time. Everything about time to us is past, present, future, and we can only be in one state at a time. 
the present. And what I said a minute ago is already in the past. What I'm about to say a minute from now is still in the future. But when I say it, it will be in the present. And then after I say it, it will be in the past. And that's all we understand about time. But what if we were in a dimension where time had no meaning and it wasn't linear like that? We're always stuck in the present. We cannot go back and we cannot go forward. Not in the third dimension. What, if, what about the fourth dimension? And did you know that God himself showed us that the fourth dimension related to time? In Genesis chapter 1, on the fourth day of creation, what did God create? The sun, the moon, and the stars. And he said this, God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night and let them be for, count these, signs and for seasons and for days and for years. The measurement of time is what these lights are for. And we measure days by the sun. We measure nights by the moon. We measure months by the moon. We measure years by the earth traveling around the sun, and it takes about a year to do that. We measure daylight and night. Are there not 12 hours in the day, Jesus said? There's 12 hours in the night, 12 hours in the day, and it's all based upon the sun. We know what month we are in because we can look up at the stars directly ahead over our heads, and we know what stars are above our head at any given day of the month and any given month of the year. So this fourth dimension and those things that are in it, they represent time. So now can you see how it could be possible that Moses could be on the mountain for 40 days in a different dimension, as it were, and the 40 days seemed as nothing to him. He didn't either eat nor drink. His body didn't need it. Same thing with um, the Goliath. Who's Goliath? He's a giant. And 1 Samuel 17, 16 says, The Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. And who was Goliath? He was of the giants. This is in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4, that there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. So Goliath represents this fourth kingdom because he's a hybrid. He represents what happens when, you, when they, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness, mingle themselves with the seed of men. You get a hybridized creature called a giant, and he came and presented himself 40 days. He represents the false gospel, and so did the Philistines, okay? Um, Elijah, 1 Kings 19, the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink, and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights unto Horeb, the mount of God something about the food or something about how God blessed him in that he was able to go in the strength of eating one meal and it lasted him 40 days. You remember what God said about the Israelites' shoes? They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. What happened to their shoes? Absolutely nothing. Their shoes didn't wear out. Their laces didn't break. The sandals didn't come apart. The kids were wearing Michael Jordans, and they kept wearing Michael Jordans. Okay? I just made that up. But not even their shoes rotted during those 40 years. God preserved them. You see what I'm getting at? The fourth dimension is different. It's a different world than things in the three in the three-dimensional universe that we live in. Now, I'm going to get to, I'm going to cut to the chase. 
And I'm going to give you a story out of the Bible, 40 day time period, when something highly significant happened. I've studied this chapter many a times. And then one day, wham! I'm reading it. I'm reading Moses talk about it in Deuteronomy. And I just went, oh my goodness. Let me show you what I mean. Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13 is when Moses picked 12 men. 12 men. How many months are there in a year? 12. And that's because every month a different set of stars is directly above our heads. We can measure what month we're in by the stars. Okay? And God said that his seed, Israel, would be as the stars of heaven. Didn't he? When the wilderness tabernacle was set up, the tabernacle was set up in the center of it, and the 12 tribes surrounded it. And God said in Psalm 19 that the heavens above were as a tabernacle for the sun. So here we have a picture of space right in the wilderness with the 12 tribes representing 12 constellations, 12 sets of stars, one for each of the 12 months of the year. Because God's people are as the stars of heaven. You see it so far? Okay, that's the significance of the number 12. Not only represents God's promise, like with the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles, but it represents God's people becoming as the stars, as the angels of heaven. Okay? So Moses picks 12 men. And here's what he says. Numbers 13, verse 17. Moses sent them, the 12 men, to spy out the land of Canaan and said unto them, Get ye up this way southward and go up into the mountain and see the land, what it is, and the people that dwelleth therein, whether they be strong or weak, few or many, and what the land is that they dwell in, whether it is be good or bad, and what cities they be that dwell in, whether in tents or in strongholds, and what the land is, whether it be fat or lean, whether there be wood therein or not, and be ye of good courage and bring the fruit of the land. Now the time was the time of the first ripe grapes. And I want you to notice that I have some things underlined here. Let's look at this and count what Moses sent them to do in the land. Strong or weak, that's two things. Few or many, that's two more things, that's four. Whether it be good or bad, that's two more things, that's six. Whether they live in tents or strongholds, that's two more things, that's eight. What the land is, whether it be fat or lean, that's two more, that's ten. And whether there be wood therein or not, that's twelve. God sent twelve men in to spy out the land to look for twelve things that would tell them whether or not, and six of them are bad and six are good. That would tell them whether or not they could live there. Perhaps in the future, we could go and live there. And remember, Canaan is a picture of heaven, right? Pastor Mike, what are you, what are you getting at? What are you saying? Just hang on. And so in Numbers 13, 25, and they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. It speaks of a different realm. Okay? And then in verse 32, 10 of the 12 came back with an evil report. They brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants. 
the sons of Anak, which came of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. So they basically said, we, we can't go in there. There's evil people that are of the race of the giants, which came, which came from the sons of God, these evil angels, aliens, and the daughters of men. We can't, we can't go in there. Now, Ecclesiastes again tells us, the thing that hath been is the thing that shall be. People like to say history repeats itself. Well, the Bible actually says that in better terms, but it says it. There is no new thing under the sun. And the thought that I had this morning was I was thinking about, I remembered watching that thing about Elon Musk and his dragon flying up into above the heights of the clouds and being up in the heaven. And I'm going, yeah, there's boy, something going on there. And I had the thought, how many men did we send into the heavens to go spy out a world that we have never been to and didn't know what was there to see whether or not it would be possible that we could live there one of these days. You know what I'm talking about? The Apollo moon landings. Because I asked myself, Mike, count it up. How many men actually walked on the moon? Well, I, I counted it in my mind, and I'm pretty sure I had the right answer, but I checked it anyway. According to the Wikipedia article, 12 people have walked on the moon. We sent 12 men to go spy out a world where we didn't know. We didn't know anything about it. We did, the moon's made of green cheese. No, it isn't. Well, we don't know. So we had to send men up there to find out exactly what is the moon made of and what, what is it like up there. And we need samples. And we need to analyze this. Is there water on the moon and all kinds of things? Yeah, we sent 12 men, starting with Apollo 11, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, Apollo 12, Two men landed. Apollo 13 didn't make it, did it? No. They didn't get to land on the moon. They had to bypass it and come back. So then Apollo 14, two men. Apollo 15, two men. Apollo 16, two men. And Apollo 17, two men. That's 12 men. And then we stopped right there. They cut the program. We haven't been back since. But now... They're talking about putting people up there permanently to live among the stars. Am I crazy? Do you know why they picked the god Apollo for those missions? Because one, one NASA guy said that it represented Apollo's chariot what are chariots? Well, the chariots of God are angels. The chariots that people are seeing up in the sky, these UFOs, that's exactly what they are. Chariots of the beast, we'll say. They chose Apollo because it was his chariot carried by four horses. Does that sound familiar from the book of Revelation? that Apollo's chariot is what carried the sun across the sky and brought a new day to the earth. Whew. 
2 Kings chapter 23, Josiah was king. And you know what he did? He took away the horses that the kings of Judah had given to the sun at the entering end of the house of the Lord by the chamber of Nathan Melech, the chamberlain which was in the suburbs, and burned the chariots of the sun with fire. See, apparently that whole idea of Apollo's chariot carrying the sun across the sky was based upon an earlier religious concept of some other god whose chariot carried the sun across the sky. And they made chariots of the sun, and Josiah said, that's wicked, I'm going to burn every one of them. And just as a, just so to, to sort of nail this down for you, and I'm going to be done here. Do you remember what the Apollo 11 patch, Apollo 11 was the first mission where they actually landed two men on the moon. And I, I believe it, I mean, I'm a big space kind of guy. I grew up in the 70s and the astronauts were heroes and I, I, I'm still that little boy looking up at the stars going, oh, I'd like to go up there one of these days. I still am. I still am. God's going to let me one of these days. So I'm kind of waiting for, for my ride. You remember what the Apollo 11 patch was? The actual lunar excursion module, the LEM, they called it, was called what? The Eagle. And when it separated from the command module where Mike Collins was, the first thing that Neil Armstrong said was, the eagle has wings. Then when they land in the Sea of Tranquility, Neil Armstrong announces to the entire world, uh, Houston, Tranquility Base here, the eagle has landed. So the Apollo patch, and they let each group of astronauts design their own patch to wear and by some work of some spirit somewhere Collins and Armstrong and Aldrin designed an eagle carrying a branch in its talons landing on the moon and Obadiah said it's one chapter in Obadiah but here's what Obadiah said though thou exalt thyself as the eagle and though thou set thy nest among the stars thence will I bring thee down saith the Lord I remember the first time I read that and I and I went I can't believe this I cannot believe this. Bible prophecy fulfilled right in front of our eyes. Though that we exalted ourselves as the eagle and we built a nest among the stars. That's where the moon is, by the way. It's among the stars. It's in the second heaven. Right before Obadiah is Amos 9. And God said, Almost the identical thing. Though they dig into hell, thence shall mine hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. So let's just say that in the back of everybody's minds, there's this idea that our earth isn't going to make it too much longer. And we're scurrying along trying to figure out a way to get our species off this planet, living amongst other planets, so that when this planet goes bad, we still survive. That's what's driving Elon Musk. He doesn't believe in our God, and he doesn't believe in our Bible. So he thinks he's bettering and serving mankind, but what he's really doing 
is that he is feeding into people's minds the fact that we need to get off this planet because when God judges this earth, well, if I'm not on the earth, he won't judge me. But God said, if, you, if you're in heaven, though you mount up uh, like an eagle and build a nest. What is a nest? It's a dwelling place for eagles where they live among the stars. Thence will I bring thee down. And then Obadiah, though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. So no matter how far out in the universe man gets from wherever they are, God's going to bring them back and judge every one of them. So now, I'm going to stop right here. And just remember that Jesus said that wherever his saints happen to be, or his elect happen to be, at the time of his appearing in the clouds, whether they be on the outermost part of the earth or the utmost part of heaven, I'm going to gather them to myself. Jews in space. Okay? We won't call it that. They're still going to stick with the title Taken. But now you see where I'm going. Okay? And I'm just following scriptures here. And I've got a lot more to share with you. Okay? It may take me a little while to get the rest of the notes together. But now you see where I'm going. It was God who foresaw that man would end up amongst the stars that God said even if they get up there I'm going to drag them back down to the earth so, I could, so I'm going to judge them I'm going to pour out my wrath upon them they're going to have to face it like everybody else does and escaping to some other planet somewhere is not going to save them there's only one salvation and that's through the blood and the cross of Jesus Christ and I hope you know that salvation you're the reason why we do what we do thank you for your prayers for us we love you We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.